Yeah, so every, I think all of you were there yesterday except for you two, is that right? Yes, so um, just to tell you, I barely talked about how I started the Forgiveness Project and I talked about a lot about my, um, my work with restorative narratives, healing narratives. Um, because stories in them, stories are very powerful. Stories stick in a way that facts and theory often don't. Um, and actually they can do as much harm as good because stories can fan the flames of prejudice and normalize hate. Um, so I choose to work with restor what I call healing narratives, restorative stories, which have a focus on healing, humanizing, uh, compassion, empathy. Um, restoration and and I, my background's journalism and I explain and then I shared some of the stories and I talked about what the complexities and contentious nature of forgiveness often what forgiveness might be what it isn't the conditions around it so um, I don't know first of all before because what I wanted to share you, with you a bit more about is sort of what I've learned through the stories of trauma that I've collected over the 15 years um, but I just wondered for any of you who were there yesterday whether you had any comments or questions you wanted to pick up on from anything I said. No, that's fine. Um, so what I wanted to share with you was this, um, the stories I've collected are very extreme. I think it's because I'm a journalist. And I always knew I wanted to grab people's attention. And the way to do that was to find, you know, the stories really, are, 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 there's a lot to do with people who have, have suffered some of the worst things that you can imagine. Um, rape, murder of a loved one, um, violent attacks, terrorism. There are also some stories in there because at one point I thought, because I kept getting responses from people out there in the world as we created the Forgiveness Project and we had the website and exhibitions. People saying, thank you so much for sharing these stories. I've had nothing like that experience in my life, but they've really helped me deal with the feud I've had with my parents or the bullying I've received at work. Um, and that really interested me that the stories help people deal with their own inner resentments and grievances. And then I thought that actually a lot, of the, a lot of the process of the trauma that people had experienced um, was actually the same as our s smaller pains. And, and it was interesting what Reynolds was talking about trauma, that you know, we, we label so many hurts and pains and suffering as trauma. So I'm really talking about pain. Um, and this is, this is kind of, I wanted to share with you a sort of trauma healing map, but we could just say pain healing map really because all the stories are about pain and then I started to collect some stories about people who had <clears throat> had feuds as I say with their parents or um, relationships there are a few stories like that as well in there mother daughter relationships what I was always looking for though was something quite strong in the sense and where possible um, to do with some kind of reconciliation with the more personal stories. Because I did realize, whereas the bigger stories about terrorism and violence um, were out there in the public domain, where someone comes and shares their story about my mother did this and she said that and, and it was terrible and she beat me up, I had to actually have the mother's story as well because it didn't feel ethical to do it otherwise. And therefore in those stories, uh, mostly, um, if, even if I haven't got the other person's stories, that I've got their permission to share the story, that this is their truth as well as the person who has been deeply harmed and hurt by what happened. So, is that clear? Is there any, just, can you just ask me questions or put up your hands or say anything? Yes. <laughs> uh, how do you get um, the permission from people about uh, you know, telling others about their stories? So, uh, well, first, is it like, difficult? And second, do you use like written permission or just oral permission? Um, with all the stories you mean? With, uh, other or, like, uh, anonymous, 
Um, so how, how does it work? In there, none of them are anonymous stories. We have photographs, oh, yes, or actually course. one is, um, but all the others aren't. And that's because he was a former jihadist. Oh, mm -hmm. And he was afraid for his life because he'd changed and alienated the group that he had been part of. But we get, um, <clears throat> we do get written permission, especially if we do audio or film of them. So we've got permissions from all of them. And I, I know all of them, actually. We, or we have contact with all of them. A handful have died since then. Um, but we still keep the stories on the website because they are real and true from the moment the story is collected. Um, and if the story is, for instance, there's one woman called Gail Kirschenbaum, who is a story all about her mother, um, but her, she's made a film about her relationship with her mother. So, you know, it is out there in the public domain. So I'm just careful about that. There is one story um, where two people have died. The, peop the father that the person talks about has died. Um, but he's also written a book about this, and I feel that it's authentic and real. But you do have to be very careful when you're sharing personal stories, because your truth isn't necessarily this person's truth. Um, so what I, wanted, what I wanted to share with you really today is this process that I see that I've identified in every single story and all the interviews I've done. And I want you to sort of think about if you recognize it in your own lives as well, because this could be a shock. This could be something that's hurt you. This could be um, a betrayal. It could be a fight. It could be an attack. Um, and, it ha well, and, you know, I can recognize it in some things that have happened to me as well. And this is called a lot like the inner circle. And when I saw, I mean, I've adapted this, actually. I haven't created this. This is not my invention, this trauma healing map. Um, but when I read about it, it was so clear to me that this was the story, even though the stories are so different. They couldn't be more different in many ways, the way they articulate what forgiveness, compassion, empathy is. Um, the actual events in their lives are different. Their cultures, their religions, their faith. Their stories are so different, and yet there's some lots of commonality in there, and that's what really interested me. So when I say, when you think of aggression, this is this thing that happens. It's not the right word, actually. It's this um, event. Can everyone kind of think of something that's really hurt them, a shock in their lives? I'm sure we're not immune to it. Um, and this is the immediate response when you're hurt. Injury, pain, and shock. And very often silence comes there um, because you cannot talk about it, or maybe just to very a few people. <clears throat> and it sinks in. And denial, you know, is another big thing. I mean, denial and suppression are very useful because they can actually make you feel stronger for a while. Um, they can give you a sort of feeling of strength. So can anger. Anger can actually be quite positive. It can be, it can make you feel as if you've got, um, you've got justice on your side. And the desire for justice and revenge, vengeful thoughts, all of this isn't bad, it's normal, and it's helpful. What is unhelpful, and this is like it's a circle, is that people get stuck in it. And I know with myself, you see, people who, who forgive, rumination, thoughts going round and round in your head, are, are quite destructive because they go, they don't help you. Um, and people who forgive, are able to let go of those painful thoughts. Um, I think with vengeful fantasies, what happens is it, you don't feel the pain anymore. Um, because all you're thinking about is what you might do or what you hope might happen to that person who's hurt you. But actually you're sort of denying the pain. And there's nothing wrong with feeling pain. 
there was um, the writer James Baldwin, an American writer, black writer, who said um, one, of the one of the reasons people hold onto their hates so stubbornly is that they fear once hate has gone, they'll be forced to deal with their pain. And very true. So these are all very useful reactions. That's James Baldwin, yeah. And of course, you know, when I'm thinking of the thing that happened to me, um, which was a long time ago, I felt very betrayed by somebody, I kept telling the story to everybody, to all my friends, my family. I felt better initially for telling the story. And it was called the right story, my story, my story of hurt. But actually you can start to alienate people. I don't know, if has anyone met anybody or ever had that experience of feeling, I need to talk about it, but actually, I'm not sure it's helping anymore. Yeah. Sometimes it can end in some sort of aggressive act, you know, hurting that other person who's hurt you, or it could be like hurting yourself. You justify it, an act of justified revenge. Um, Justified anger, righteous in indignation. Um, and so I'm sort of, this is where all the stories I collected from all these people, from victims and perpetrators of crime and violence, this is where they have lived to start with, sometimes for years, sometimes for decades. So there's one, one of my storytellers who is an amazing man from. America from Oklahoma. Um, his daughter was killed in the Oklahoma bombing, the first massive terrorist attack on US land. And for the first year or two, he talks a lot about these, this desire for justice and revenge. He dreams about killing the perpetrators. Every day he goes to the bomb site and he thinks, what, what can he do to get justice? He's, he talks about his relationship suffering, his job suffering, his peace of mind shattered. And then he describes, it's very moving the way he describes it. He said, one day I went to the bomb site and I looked down over the ruins and I thought to myself, I have to do something differently because what I'm doing isn't working. And it was at that point that he made a decision to try and meet the father of the bomber. And he goes to have tea with him, and he meets the, the father's daughter, the sister of Tim McVeigh, who was the man who had planted the bomb. And I think 167 people died in that bomb, so it's massive. Um, and there was a connection. There was a connection between the two fathers. And as he left, he realized he, says, he said to me, I realized I'd met a bigger victim of the Oklahoma, Oklahoma bombing than, than me. Because while I can go out there and speak you know, wonderful, loving words about Julie, he can never even say he had a son. And, and you know, it, the story progresses. He starts to campaign against the death penalty. Um, and in the end, he comes, in the end, you know, there's been a good year of this, but as, as I said, it can go on for decades. Um, and in the end, he does for, forgive Tim McVeigh, who never showed any remorse, by the way, mm. but he felt he, did, he needed to forgive for his own sort of moral and spiritual inner, inner being and peace of mind. And it was an important, and he was a, he was a Christian man, but that, that in a way was irrelevant in the sense that it didn't come motivated by his faith. He said it came sort of motivated from his belief in humanity and also his recognition that as all of us being connected as human beings, some of us fail. 
you know, it's this thing about collective responsibility in a way. And there was something Reynolds said, and I can't quite remember, but it triggered that in my memory, that, you know, we are all responsible. We're all part of a society. And some of us do terrible things. Are we going to push them out there and not include them in our lives, not include them as human, label them as evil, or are we going to see them as fallible, and failing humans like us. Um, so, any questions or any disagreements? Because <coughs> it's, uh, yeah, thank you. I have a question about it, uh, this uh, telling and retelling the story. Uh, can it also be that the story is uh, kind of growing? Changing yeah. in the process? Yes, it absolutely. Bigger, bigger or maybe smaller. smaller. Maybe smaller. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm thinking of another, another very extreme story, and I need to stress they're not all like this, but mm -hmm. I remember this is a woman, again, an American woman whose eight year old daughter was abducted and murdered. And for, she used to go to, um, she created online this avatar of the killer who she could torture. And she talked about, she talks very clearly about how in the end, the telling of the story was beginning to poison her life. She was beginning to feel as, you know, in a way like the person who had killed her daughter. And she just says, if I didn't stop, I would be buried alongside my daughter in the ground. And that's what changed her. And in fact, actually what changed her and this change, because I'm going to come on to the outer circle in this minute, in a minute, this change can be anything. It can be, it can be um, Bud Welsh, who's the Oklahoma father, who makes a conscious decision, I need to do something differently because what I'm doing isn't working. Or it can be the woman whose daughter was abducted and murdered, who was watching television one day, and it was the trial of a serial killer in America. They have all these things on television and the impacts that all the victims, parents, loved ones, were giving their impact, victim in impact statements. And she recognised herself. They were um, pouring out venom at this terrible man who'd done unspeakable things. And they were weeping and crying and screaming and shouting and she recognised herself. And then this man came, who was a, uh, he was a Christian man, and he looked at, this is all on television, this is what she saw, she, he, this man looked at the killer, and he looked at him and he said, you have really, really exercised my faith, but I want you to, and then began to speak about forgiveness. And as he did so, the man on trial, the serial killer, tears began to run down his face. And as she watched this, she thought, I've got to be like him. And that was the, that was the moment. So this can also have, it could be something you read, it could be something you see, it could be something that's said to you. It's a moment that starts to take you on another path. And just one more example, because we share the stories of perpetrators and ex-offenders. Um, so we share the story of someone called Arno Michaelis, who was a former white supremacist responsible for much, many acts of violence in the, U, in the US, in America. And he had swastikas tattooed on his knuckles. And he went to McDonald's one day. And this is the key moment for him. He went into McDonald's. There was a black woman serving. He thrust his knuckles, ordered some food. She looked at them and she said, looked at him in the eyes. She wasn't at all perturbed. She just said, you know, you're, I see you and you're, worth, and you're worth more than that. You are more than that. That's what she said. You're more than that. And she said it with compassion and he describes how he fled from the um, McDonald's, unable to deal with her compassion. And, and now he says, it was the forgiveness I received from those I hated that allowed me to move from hate to love. And he started an organization called Life After Hate. 
And it was that moment. I mean, maybe he was ready in a way. It could have been something else. But it's, this always fascinates me what it is that triggers. triggers. But now there are also one or two people, and very few, who literally never do this. So my very good friend, and very sadly died of an illness last year, but he did a lot of work for the Forgiveness Project. He was called Shad Ali. And in 2008, he was randomly attacked in the street, kicked in the head, was nearly died, had operations for two years. But he described waking up in the hospital the next morning after the attack, filled with peace, absolutely convinced that the only way through this was not to hate. And also, really, because I talked about curiosity yesterday, curious. What is it in someone that they could just attack me in the street and beat me up? I need to know. And he ended up meeting, it took him five years, he ended up meeting the man who had hit him. We filmed their, what's called a restorative justice conference. I don't know, do you have restorative justice here? Do you, does anyone know what it is? Because we do it quite a bit. It's Canada, Australia, it's big. We do it quite a bit, and in America it's quite a bit. It's when a victim of crime meets face-to-face -face their offender. The offender has to be ready to apologize. The victim is able to ask questions. The sense is that the criminal justice system still operates, but this is about a conflict between two people, usually. And it's about restoring their humanity and mending I mean, it's not to say that some of them do become friends. It's quite extraordinary. And on our website, we have some stories like that. But usually, it's a meeting and they go their separate ways. Very evidence has shown very healing for the victim, who is no longer so scared, sleeps better. Lots of very good evidence around that. But also, it reduces reoffending. There's good evidence that 17% better reoffending rates when you have restorative justice. So Shad, who woke up in a state, you could say of forgiveness, from his terrible ordeal, never did this circle at all. So I'm now going to move to... Oh, may I ask, I was thinking yeah. in this inner circle, um, is there any points that are easier to break, to get out from this? Um, well, I should say you don't necessarily do it in that order and you don't necessarily do all those things. Um, and I think, you see, everyone is so individual, it's hard to say. Um, I don't think so. But if you do think so... Well, on these examples, it is very clear, because I think for the anger and desire for revenge. Uh, yeah. So when, when the, these people uh, decided, okay, yeah. I'm letting it go, yeah. Yeah. it seemed yeah, to yeah. be... A, a yeah, I think that's true, because they feel so bad. It doesn't make you feel good to feel angry, does it, really? Initially, empowering. If it goes on, it begins to corrupt, I think. Anger and revenge, and you're right. I think then people look for another way. Um, but also silence. Maya Angelou speaks about, she was, I can't remember if she was raped or very badly abused as a child, five-year-old. She speaks about going, uh, actually I can't remember how old she was, but I think for, few years she doesn't speak, doesn't open her mouth. And she says it was her self-defense then, but she now talks about there's no, you know, there's no greater agony than an untold story, because she recognizes that she may have stayed silent all her life and it wouldn't have helped her. And part of her healing was telling her story as an adult. Do you know Maya Angelou here, the American writer? Anything else? No. So one thing that also interests me, and anyone who's done any reading about loss and grief, you know, can't quite see this, but um, this is about the realisation of loss is very different to true mourning and going into grief. I mean... My father died last year, and I inherited a legal case from Romania. It's a long story, which I won't go into. 
but I discover, we discovered the legal case two, two weeks after he died. And I realize I'm there, but I haven't been, it's been so stressful that I haven't been able to mourn the loss of my father. And it actually feels really bad, and I don't know when I'll be able to. And, I've, and I sense it's very unhealthy, and I sense this part is so important. Mm -hmm. Feeling the pain. And feeling the pain, but meeting it with compassion. This is what happens and is able to be. Because other, the other, this thing, trauma, is also about freezing of emotions. This is the unfreezing. So this says accepting loss and confronting fear. This is where, all, where emotions start to become real. And this is where empathy and compassion come in as well. So because the other thing about why me, this is what victims feel. And this is an interesting thing. Even victims, and I've met some, who are burgled, feel it was my fault because somehow, you know, I left a light on upstairs or this is the normal response of a victim. Yeah. So to move from why me to why them, why him, why her, is a really big move. And this is absolutely key to the healing, I think. And this is very hard if you've been hurt. And I don't know if anyone is very, very angry with someone right now. <coughs> rehumanize. How do you rehumanize that person who's really hurt you? Because also then it can come, why us? Oh. And it's more than tolerance as well. I mean, tolerance is a really interesting word, and I think it's really important. But sometimes, I don't know, do you really have any views about the word tolerance? Because I often talk about the Forgiveness Project as like promoting tolerance. But maybe, it's... Yes. Maybe understanding is uh, yeah. better. For me, it works maybe better because what does it mean to be tolerant? But maybe it means that I understand the other yeah. position, the other person. Uh, I think so. Because tolerance can also be, me almost have a sort of I'm an acceptance, but not going that extra step. To understanding. Yes. Yesterday I also spoke about how, I don't know if I did say this directly, but I'll say it now. But when I first started the Forgiveness Project, I became quite clear to me in that first year of collecting stories that I didn't want to preach to people, and tell them they should forgive through the stories. So the stories we share are about empathy, compassion, and forgiveness, about <coughs> restoration, about rehumanization, rehumanizing. But not all of them actually talk about forgiveness. We call it the Forgiveness Project because actually I love the word. I love, I love to talk about forgiveness, and it's always a fabulous conversation. Everybody has an opinion, everyone has a view, everyone has an experience. But it was important, so this here, choice to forgive, it's a choice. And what's interesting for me is that one of our storytellers called Rami Elahan, who's an Israeli father whose teenage daughter was killed in a suicide bomb, he says, I do not forgive and I do not forget. But the suicide bomber was a victim, like my daughter, grown bitter from shame and poverty. And he, is, he acts in a completely, everything mm. he does is about building bridges, about seeing the humanity in the other. He, he works for, or he does work with an organization called the Parent Circle, because all pain is the same. So people who have lost loved ones on both sides work together in this organization called the Parent Circle. Um, but he doesn't like the word forgiveness. It, it, for him, it doesn't work. So when I started collecting the stories, I didn't want to exclude 
for me, the one thing every story has in common is that they draw a line under the dogma of vengeance. So, n so all do not believe in the value of revenge. <coughs> and all believe in the value of compassion. So this is the rewriting of the story. You tell a different story. Now, all our storytellers want to tell their stories. Um, and I think it's because they see that it helps other people. It helps them, actually. But they go to prisons. They share it with us on the website or in the exhibition that we have called the F Word Exhibition. Yeah. I don't know if any of you can think of a, a situation where it might not be valuable to tell your story. I mean, is it always a good thing, do you think? <coughs> well, there was a lot of discussion about this Me Too uh, campaign. Mm. And some people said, like, oh, like, you should never like, uh, be ex exposed. exposed. <laughs> and there was lots yeah. of criticism about this. And I think many people feel that they shouldn't tell the story because maybe because of their lo loved ones, maybe mm. they don't want mm. people to find out about some terrible yeah. things. That I think that's right. Because it does expose people. You have to be prepared for criticism. I've been quite shocked by one or two. I shared with you the story of Jill Hicks yesterday, who lost both her legs in the London terrorist bombings in 2005. Mm -hmm. She's a phenomenal woman, absolutely extraordinary. Again, another one who doesn't actually use the word <coughs> forgiveness, but she talks always about not hating. Mm -hmm. She gets so much hate, hate on the internet because how dare she, a victim of, brut of this brutal regime ideology, how dare she talk about not <coughs> hating? You know, they, I would have thought she would be protected in some way, that if I say something like that, I'm a fair target. But I would have thought, because of what happened to her and her extreme injuries, mm. people would have compassion, not at all. So, and also the other thing is re-traumatization. I think, you know, we've had to be careful in the prison. Um, there was one woman who stopped telling her story after a while, and she doesn't do it at all anymore. Um, she just realized it was very helpful to her for a while, and then it's, she felt a bit stuck in the telling of the story. I mean, everyone's different. But for most, I would say it's very, very healing to see the impact that your story can have on others but also for themselves, to see that it's about, again, about this meaning making, to create meaning out of loss, out of suffering, out of trauma, is, is part of getting through. Um, but also, uh, did you come across people who wouldn't tell their stories because they feel, as you said, somehow guilty for what has happened, or they feel that was something that uh, was just um, um, inevitable or yeah. they, they, they don't see this as, as, as aggression. Like some women who put up with uh, Yes, violence. of course, yes. Yes, many. I mean, obviously there are many people who don't want to share their stories for multiple reasons. And that's People fine. Even feel themselves as being victims. Yeah, yeah, yes, of course. But those who come to us, or we find, they do want to share their stories. They feel it's going to have an impact mm -hmm. on the world and create a safer world. And, and as I say, be helpful to them. It's a two-way thing, entirely. Um, can I just ask you how long we should have, Lorena? Just so I can, how much more, 10 minutes more? I think lunch is at one. So we can okay. finish maybe 5 to 1. Okay, yeah. Or at 1. Do ask questions. I don't want. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you speak about people who tell the stories and who are not uh, doing it, but can it also happen so that if the person is telling the story because she's on a way on, uh, of healing? Yeah. And then there comes some kind of remiss, and, and the person feels that no, I'm kind of. Yes. Going back to something or, or yes, not definitely. Not there was definitely 
I think, a premature telling of a story. Yeah. <laughs> and I've definitely experienced that and been in that situation. Or, there can, because people are working it out still. Well, there is a woman, a woman called Marianne Coburn who works with us, and her daughter was given very lethal drugs. She was experimenting in drugs. She was 15. She took this pill and had a terrible effect on her, and she died. And Mary Ann started talking about her story within weeks, no, months. And in fact, she's not an example why it was too early. I felt it was too early when I met her, but then I realized it was keeping her alive. So then what happens is you have to really offer so much support. You have to, as, as a organization, we are responsible for the well-being and the welfare of these people if we're asking them to go into a prison and share their story. So as long as the care is there, I think it will work. Another example was a woman whose son had been killed by gangs and they never found the perpetrator and she was very upset about that. But she came to the prison to share her story on the anniversary of her son's death. And I didn't know this. So she was sitting with a lot of young men sharing her story. And for the first time, she told it in a totally different way. She was quite angry. She was upset. And she started shaking her finger at them. And she said, you guys, you don't know what you're doing to your mothers. Very angry. I'd never heard her speak like that before. But for me, it was very educative. Because as she was doing that, I saw them going like this. The men, the young men. They were all 15 to 16 to 20. And it made me realize why we work with these restorative narratives. Because actually, if you go into a place with a story of aggression and sadness and brokenness, you won't your audience will not be able to listen. It's either too uncomfortable, especially with the young offenders in prison. They, were, they just said, you know, we weren't responsible for your son. You know, they felt attacked. So it was really quite an education for me to see how important the, ten, the actual telling of the story was, the way you delivered the story. And so we get... That helped me develop some training for our storytellers when they give their story in person, how to tell it. Mm. Yeah, because really it needs to be an authentic story from the heart. You don't ignore the pain. You don't ignore the inner circle, <coughs> but you're not in the inner circle. She was in it when she told her story. And it had a very, it had the complete opposite effect as it should have had. Um, So then we come to sort of justice. I'm trying to think what this means. Can anyone help me? I can't really think what it means. Rewriting, Rewriting history. It's sort of like telling a different story, isn't it? Yes. Negotiating solutions. I mean, that might be sort of move, going out. That could be about reconciliation, you see, because we can come up to moving towards reconciliation. But I think it's really important to realise that reconciliation can be reconciling with your pain it doesn't have to be with someone who's hurt you or reconciling that life isn't fair that good people do bad things that bad things happen to good people that the world is morally complicated that you know to use Reynolds's example husbands leave wives wives leave husbands out of the blue um, yeah so I think, I always think that, um, one, I don't know what you feel about this, but I know a lot of people who <laughs> stop talking to other people. Is this common in Estonia? <laughs> we start in the first place. <laughs> it's something I've never actually, I've had it in my life, but it's never been <laughs> my motivation. But it seems to be a very common response to being hurt. I will not talk to you anymore. Finished. I won't reply to your texts, your emails. Our relationship is over. It's like an exile. It feels very brutal to me. Um, and while I would never prescribe forgiveness, I actually think 
in human relationships. It's an oil, you know, and um, there's this, this, this belief we have that people should behave like us and we make assumptions about people, but when they don't, we then exile them. And I think forgiveness is giving up on that expectation, you know, and accepting that people mess up. Um, yes, yeah, so, you know, I think Forgive, one thing I do do really believe is that forgiveness, having a forgiving attitude, is the oil of personal relationships. And we have a poet called David White in England, and he wrote a nice line. He said, all friendships of any length, in other words, big friendships, are based on continual and mutual forgiveness. It's the same in families, I think. It's a big, big thing. Um, so, any thoughts? Any comments? Uh, I have a question about, uh, is it wise to, when someone is in pain and in, in trauma, is it wise to encourage uh, him or her to talk about this or is it better to just wait when he, he, he comes to this herself? Mm -hmm. That's a good question because I'm, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a psychologist. I consider myself to be a, a journalist and a facilitator of stories. So I've never tried to persuade anyone to tell a story. I do it once they're ready or when they have already done it or, or I may suggest it and they say, yes, that's what I want to do. So I don't think it can be forced. And if you do want to share your story, it's probably best to start with a close friend and, or, or a therapist or something like that. Because I think it it's not always the right thing to do. Certainly not publicly. Yeah, I, I just mean to include Oh, you meant publicly. Yes. I thought you meant but just... Not publicly, yeah. Just when your, your friend is struggling with something. Yes. Is, that's what you meant. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Then it is, I think. Definitely. Hmm. But this, uh, this work is, is um, it's not without criticism. I mean, I must say, actually, over the 15 years, I've received remarkably little criticism. And I believe that's because it is the stories that speak um, and that people see them as authentic criticism. So while the individual people, as I said, especially those who have you know, talked about compassion in terms of ISIS or, you know, they get a lot of hate. And some of the former racists, we have about four stories from people who were members of racist groups and who have changed. And they say, we moved from being the hater to being the hated. <clears throat> because it's seen as an act of betrayal. And in fact, anyone talking about forgiveness can be seen as an act of betrayal. Because everyone else wants you to become stuck in your righteous anger. But one, um, I did get a criticism from a politician once who wrote a letter saying, your project condones and rewards murder, which was quite a difficult letter to receive. The reason he was doing that, he was in a bomb attack on the Conservative Party, you know, our politicians, a long time ago when a hotel was bombed and five people died. And his, he was injured and his wife was very badly injured. And we have the story of the man who planted that bomb. And that man has never, in his view, adequately showed remorse because that man was part of the IRA. Do you know about the IRA? In the Irish. He was part of that and he believed that at the time he had no choice but to take up arms and fight the English, the British. He says he would never do it now, but he says, at the time, I was a freedom fighter. I had no choice. We were being flattened. People will, do not want to hear that story. They want him to say, and I think he's quite brave to keep sharing the story because he comes to a lot of criticism, but they want him to say, I should never have belonged to the IRA. It was terrible what I did. I am living with the guilt all my life. I'm deeply, deeply sorry. He says to the woman that he shares his story with, whose father was killed in that same bomb, he says, I am deeply, deeply sorry your father died, but I had no choice. 
So that's very difficult. And you can see why the politician wrote me that letter. Mm -hmm. But his story's still there. So what do you think? Sh should he, uh, does it suggest that he, he really uh, didn't have choice? Well, clearly he had choice, but um, I, I don't agree with him, but I respect his yeah. view. And I think it's very honest, because it would be, in a way, it'd be much easier for him to lie now. <coughs> it wasn't like hate, it was fear. Yes. It is, you know, the same emotion almost. But, mm. it's, it's, uh, but this is this, the same what uh, Hannah Arendt was uh, writing about, about this, uh, what's the case of this Nazi officer who said, I didn't have choice, I, I was just fulfilling my orders. Yeah. And that, that's when she wrote about. Well, she wanted to write about banality of evil, but uh, yeah, sort of. Mm -hmm. She kind of she mm -hmm. saw this man as yes. being just a you know, um, kind of clerk, you know, bureaucrat who is yeah. just you know killing people out of orders because but he's a good uh, worker, he's a good uh, clerk. <laughs> and it was the law of the land at that time. Yeah, yeah and, and then she asked, uh, "What would you have done?" You know, and, and that really asks us to put ourselves in the shoes. And then uh, the, her friends uh, in, in, uh, in, in Israel, the Jewish friends, they, they uh, con con condemned her for, for saying yeah, these right. things because yeah. she, didn't, uh, um, that's right. she didn't make a monster out of him. What's his name? Eichmann, is it? But I have another story in Simon because I'm a historian, so the stories are from the past. But uh, again, about how difficult it is what you call human rehumanize the enemy. Yeah. And I've just uh, come across people who didn't have personal experience of uh, deportations. But for example, uh, I met a woman who was a, a medical worker, a Soviet medical worker. And during the deportations, she had a call in the morning uh, that she had to go with her suitcase as a, as a, as a nurse. And she, did, she was told where. And she had to go to these trains where, uh, you know, hundreds of people, families, mm. were put, you know, mm. and, and sent to Siberia. And she was a medical worker and she had to be there. And she said, I didn't even know like what was the order. And when she opened her medical case, which she was given, no, she didn't take it, she was given, she said there was no even proper equipment for, you know, actually helping people on the train. And there were two women who, who gave birth on this train. Mm. She had to wow. take, she had to deliver the babies. Yeah. She was, uh, when they arrived to their destination, she was like going and knocking on the doors and saying like, you have to do something about these people, you know, they just have no basic medical equipment. She was, and she was, she was, she was in her 90s when she told me the story and uh, I could see that it was really sincere and she was herself oh, pregnant at the time. Wow, that's incredible. So when I wrote this story for an article and it was to be published in the, in the volume about the Baltic memories, there was a woman from Lithuania who told me, this is all lies. She, she, I, you should have never believed her. Oh, goodness. She doesn't, she, she wouldn't have this compassion. She's just made this up. Oh. So that was the, and I said, why, why, why do you think we, we couldn't believe, you know, people yeah. that as mm. a medical worker, she, she was helping the people. She said, no, no, she, it's like the enemy, the image of the enemy, because she was serving the, these authorities who were, so I think it's it's a very powerful uh, kind of, um, I don't know, frame of mind mm. that people uh, find it very difficult to accept that somebody actually on this other side is human yes. and can have even like That's right. you know, something positive <laughs> you know, in, in the way they think. Yeah. So I think, yeah. Kind of have you read um, the book The Sunflower? Do you know that book? No. By Simon Wiesenthal. It's quite, it's a fascinating book. He was asked by a dying Nazi soldier, so it must have been in 1945, for forgiveness. He was a Jew, or maybe a bit later. He, um, and he was a bit of a, a writer and a philosopher as well. And so he just, he then went to ask this question, did he have the right to offer forgiveness to this Nazi on behalf of the Jews? 
you know, and that he asked all these leading thinkers at the time in the 50s, I think it was. And so just a really interesting book about the sort of philosophical debate about who has the right to forgive what. I think most people came to the conclusion he didn't have, he didn't, by the way, offer forgiveness. And, and most people agreed that he shouldn't, but one or two people thought he should. But there is such a thing as, um, I mean, when I talked yesterday about forgiveness being contentious, um, there was a case a few, three or four years ago, where a young white man in Charleston, America, went into a church and shot about, I can't remember, between five and eight parishioners at worship. And almost the next day, some of the survivors talked about forgiveness to this young, black, white, racist boy. And there was a lot, a lot of, in the press about it, a lot of anger. And because people were saying, how can black, um, black forgiveness condones white violence? So a lot of black activists were actually saying, don't talk about forgiveness. This is just going to make everything worse. So I thought that was really interesting. And then other people were saying, it's too early. Premature forgiveness. How can you talk about forgiveness the day after your mother's been shot in a church? So it's interesting debates, you know. Makes the subject forever fascinating to me, anyway. So we're nearly time up. If anyone has one, anything more to say, well, otherwise we could. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you.